but now we have uh, Shan Gao on the um, on the schedule with her presentation, and she already introduced herself. Uh, so I will just uh, hand it over to her right away. Okay. So oh okay. So I I, I will share my screen right now. Okay. Can everybody see my screen right now? Yeah. Can everybody see my screen now? Uh, yes, we can see it. Okay. So so. Uh, I have to thank you for giving me the opportunity to share my uh, research here. And um, uh, the topic of my talk today is wilderness and the Chinese mind. As you may know that there is a very famous book written by Nas is uh, Wilderness and the American Mind. <laughs> and um, so, but wilderness in Chinese mind is very, it's very uh, wilderness in the Chinese mind is very different from the imagination of wilderness in the American mind. And um, so as we, uh, um, before I talk about wilderness and the Chinese mind, I will introduce a little bit about wilderness culture. Uh, as uh, Nas wrote in his book, uh, Wilderness and the American Mind, and he argues that it is a basic element in US culture and also maybe in Australia, the culture of Australia. And um, uh, from the website or from my personal experience with the uh, American wilderness, I do find the American, the wilderness culture in the United States is very, uh, is very rich. Uh, like the first one is that um, uh, Amer in the United States, there are very systematic national park system, which lasts over 100 years. And uh, also wilderness uh, is an important part of national parks. And uh, right now the idea of national park as the best idea of uh, the United States had moved to China. Uh, just uh, a few years ago, and China, uh, in, uh, in, uh, there is a, a commission like uh, economic and uh, uh, reform commission in China, and they uh, raise a very important uh, uh, just a theme that creating national parks uh, system in China. So. Uh, Chinese society right now start uh, studying from the United States about the construction of national parks. And there are a lot of nonprofit organizations has um, moved to China and uh, start a cooperation like WWF and IUCN and a lot of other nonprofit organizations and will help to creating national parks. And um, also in the United States, wilderness is closely related to recreation. There are a lot of very primitive rec uh, ways of recreation like hiking in the wilderness, hiking, camping, uh, and uh, uh, horse riding in wilderness area. I have a lot of personal experience of their recreation. Like when I pursue my PhD degree in the Department of Philosophy at University of North Texas, as you know, in, the, in that university, the philosophy department mainly focus on environmental philosophy. Uh, and uh, so um, they, uh, the, they, they focus on uh, the uh, environmental uh, philosophy research and um, I, while I pursue my PhD degree there, I organize a lot of camping activities outside and give me a lot of inspiration. Also give a lot of inspiration um, for the people who participating in the camping. And uh, like in China, there's not a very rich culture, camping culture like in the United States. Although some people, young people, maybe enjoy camping, but a lot of people, when during the weekend, they choose to uh, maybe go to a restaurant to eat together because in Chinese society, the food culture is very rich. And there's um, uh, a lot of uh, very delicious foods 
uh, our, uh, because of the uh, thousand years of agrarian culture. So people enjoy food together. So it's also a certain culture when people eat together, they share their understanding of the food and they share the emotions and feelings. So it's kind of a, a, a focus on the interpersonal feelings within human beings through eating together. And uh, also in the United States, we can find the wilderness education is very developed. Uh, you may, uh, as you know that the National Outdoor Leadership School is about wilderness education, it's very developed. Uh, it's a very uh, influential nonprofit organizations in the United States. Also in the United States, there's a wilderness act like in 1964. And um, um, when I do research, I find uh, philosophies, especially transcendental philosophies and uh, promote uh, the, uh, in, to promote the creation of wilderness act. And uh, also in the United States, we can find a lot of wilderness research centralized, out of Leopold Wilderness Re Research Center in Montana, and a lot of books like uh, Calicut, um, that is my former advisor, and he added a lot of books about wilderness debate rages on, and uh, also articles, over hundreds of articles. Um, also, there are not nonprofit organizations like Wilderness Society and International Wilderness Foundation. So I, I do find that there's very rich wilderness culture. Maybe in other countries, there's also wilderness culture. In European wilderness culture, I'm not very familiar with, but uh, I'm very excited to know that European Wilderness Society has promoted a lot of culture there. And uh, uh, so next one is that, and I find uh, in the website, uh, the Wilderness Society website, there's a definition. So wilderness represents a vital element of Europe, natural and cultural heritage. In addition to their intrinsic value, they offer the opportunity for people to experience the spiritual quality of nature in a well dist experience racial science beyond mere physical and visual attributes. So when I read the passage, in fact, I'm intellectually very excited because in my uh, research, many years of research on wilderness philosophy, I, um, I, I try to uh, prove a, an idea that wilderness have, has intrinsic value. But my, uh, my justification for uh, the intrinsic value in wilderness is very different from the justification uh, made by Holm Rostin and Paul Taylor. And I use the Chinese approach to justify that nature has, wilderness has intrinsic value. Also, I find that the definition stress about uh, uh, stress about intrinsic value, also the opportunity for people to experience spiritual quality, spiritual energy of nature, is also my own, my research. Folks is also the main focus of my research, and um, so that is uh, the I recently learned about just the definition of European uh, uh, definition. Also in the United States, also in the United States in the 1964, uh, 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 the Wilderness Act, also there is a dimension of like um, value, uh, value dimension and is that dimension because you know one standard of a Wilderness Act in the United States stress the solitude. Solitude is they think the one standard for wilderness is that it provides um, ample uh, opportunity for enjoyment of solitude. I think this word solitude is has the value dimension, has also aesthetic dimension. And uh, also uh, there's the IUCN, there's a category 1B is that wilderness area, there's a definition protected areas that are usually large and modified or slightly modified areas, retaining their natural character and influence without permanent 
are a significant human habitation, which are protected and managed as so as to preserve their natural condition. So I find that this uh, definition uh, is very policy oriented. There's no value dimension here. It doesn't, the definition doesn't stress the intrinsic value, aesthetic value of the wilderness. They focus on some uh, physical conditions. Okay, so this is a big difference I find uh, among the three definitions of wilderness. And in China, the, uh, the, right now, environmental conservation is gaining a lot of support uh, from the government, also from nonprofit organizations, and uh, people start realizing the importance of environmental conservation. But however, not many people focus on wilderness conservation, even though even there are a lot of uh, nonprofit organizations by the name is not wilderness conservation. I, I know that in the Peking University, there's a professor and he uh, established an organization It's called Mountain and Water uh, Conservation. Mo mountain and Water, because mountain and water represents the Chinese people's aesthetic understanding of nature. But however, in fact, the mountain and waters is are very weak. Um, so we still do not know what are the mountains and waters. They may trigger people's uh, just the poetic imagination of nature, but however, we really need to define what are what is nature, what are the parts of nature we should conserve. We really need a scientific definition, also aesthetic, also philosophical. But China used, do not use the wilderness, they use the ecological red line, ecological red line. It's also termed as bottom line and lifeline, lifeline. It will cover regions with important ecological functions, including water and soil conservation, biodiversity maintenance, as well as windbreak and sand fixa fixation, along with ecological fragile regions, which are prone to soil erosion, de desertification, and uh, salinization. By the end of 2020, the demarcation of the border and the calibration of the regions should be completed, and ecological protection red line system will be basically established. So from this kind of definition, we can find that the definition are very technical and scientifically oriented. And the, the value part is not stressed here. Also the psychological part is also not stressed here. So um, it's stressed about lifeline, it's supporting life, bottom line. And um, so now I will move on to the philosophical schools and the value of wilderness. So there, in China, there's um, the, in the, from the policy level, um, the wilderness is not used. But however, in the academic level, we do find that some professors will advocate that we should use the opportunity of creating national parks, a very big project in China, to uh, establish wilderness areas. So to conserve wilderness. So the professor's name is Yang Rui. He's in the he's the dean of the uh, the uh, National Park Research in Tsinghua University, and uh, he has a uh, a lot of team members. You know, a lot of team members like Chao Yue and Zhang Qian, and uh, they they do a lot of research which are. Uh, uh, related to wilderness, like Chao Yue, uh, the Dr. Chao Yue, who is the uh, doctor student of Professor Yang Rui. He do, his research is about mapping, mapping wilderness in China. So, but however, only a small number of professors who advocate wilderness conservation and um, is still cannot gain um, 
support from the public and also from the, a lot of uh, governmental organizations, because a lot of people, when they hear the word, they think it's very Western and um, is not very Chinese. Uh, so we shouldn't use the term wilderness. And so in that way, we really need to find why, what, why they have the attitude, negative attitude towards wilderness, why they think is uh, is Western and not suited to Chinese culture. And we, we do find a lot of answers from the research on the Chinese philosophy and also Chinese culture. So we can find the Chinese character for the concept of the Huang Ye. The Huang means, it's a two different words. In fact, there are two different Chinese words to express the concept of wilderness in English. Uh, it means the first Huang means grass fills the land one day and wilderness means the place uh, outside the city. Uh, um, the, um, so it's very negative because from the definition we can find that uh, the, they have the, uh, the, the, the wilderness land is wasted and need to be cultivated in order to have value. But however, right now, the ecological practice in China have the potential to change people's value on wilderness, like national park project, as I mentioned just now. Also, there's a lot of ecological restoration and the project like returning the green plows to forestry or returning green plows to wetland and also fast urbanization pro process creates a lot of wilderness area areas within the countryside also within the city. And uh, oh, I don't know how much time left. So uh, it's just the, the host can remind me if I'm out of time. Yeah, and, sure. uh, it's, so normally um, your time is over now, but we have a break scheduled for half an hour now. So if you want to continue, uh, there's no problem. There's no problem. OK, I will, I will just go quickly. And wilderness imagination in Confucianism, Taoism, uh, it is like I I I focus on Confucianism and Taoism because you know, in the it, because of two philosophical schools in, in a uh, especially Confucianism is a past, uh, is kind of very uh, core values within the society and it influenced the Chinese civilization for thousands of years. So um, it's very important to understand how Confucianism view concept of nature. For Confucianism, it is a process of production and reproduction life. Life is understood through direct experience of it rather than through scientific interpretations. So the natural element which to contribute to flourishing life is aesthetically appreciated. So you can find uh, in the Chinese culture, people use at least 20 terms to express the concept of nature, like wind and water, and mountains and waters, uh, and the soil and the, the land, and uh, also directions, directions like east, west, and south, and uh, they are considered as natural uh, elements. Also, the wind, and also the time, also the space. But the time and space are closely related to the growth of life and um, is uh, the foundations of for values you know uh, the nature is the foundation for values within human relationship they are called values and in confucianism those values come from nature so life in the wilderness elements which contribute to the flesh and wild plants and animals are neglected so about Wild animals, you know, we can find a lot of research articles about aesthetic appreciation of wild animals and plants. But in Chinese culture, if, uh, because of influences from Confucianism, and uh, many people maybe choose to eat wild animals rather than aesthetically appreciate the beauty. So that is, I think this can, we can find sources of this kind of action from philosophy. But in, 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 uh, in Chinese philosophy, there are another school is not very dominant schools as Taoism, you can find uh, wilderness, it, you know, has a positive imagination in Taoism. And in Taoism, you know, um, 
they use the concept of the Taoism and they use the concept of nature. So nature doesn't refer to wilderness, it refers to value itself. So it has value dimension. So Taoism criticized the core values within society advocated by Confucianism, I think that it harmed the inborn vitality of human nature. So just because, you know, um, the, the, the cultural critique, the Taoism strongly object to the core values advocated by Confucianism, and uh, they think wilderness is a place for people to gain the inborn vitality and escape the harmful influences of values in society. But however, wilderness is not a physical place in Taoism. It's not a scientific, it's not a place which is interpreted, defined by science or ecological science or biology. It's just imagination, imagining, imagination. So uh, this is uh, uh, wilderness and imagination. And um, uh, so I, I think in Chinese culture, just uh, due to the strong influences by Confucianism and Taoism, and uh, uh, right now we, um, if in order to make people to realize the importance of the value in wilderness, we, we cannot use a Western approach because in the Western approach to value the wellness, I find that there's a, uh, find, I find there's a metaphysical foundation in God, in religion, also in ecological science. But in Chinese long-term philosophical, philosophical tradition, we do not have the metaphysical foundation from God because you know, Confucian Taoism, although many philosophers can just uh, think Western philosophers think it belong to religion, but however, in China, in China, they are housed in the philosophy department. In Confucianism, Taoism, we do not have the concept of the God, like a metaphysical image, and uh, we have a complete different understanding of metaphysics. So we cannot use that way to justify the intrinsic value of wilderness. We have to uh, use the Chinese way. So I, I, I think that experience, I stress experience a lot. And I think personal experience of wilderness really can change people's values towards wilderness. So um, I, a few years ago, just in, uh, in 2018, I published a paper called From Interest Value to the Emotion of Wonder the paradigm shift in the construction of Chinese environmental ethics. We may, if we want to make people realize, acknowledge the intrinsic value of wilderness, we cannot just justify the intrinsic value of wilderness, maybe from religion, maybe from science, but however, we can cultivate a emotion of wonder. So, uh, as we know, uh, there's um, in environmental ethics, you know, how Wilson published a book, they use the concept of intrinsic value to construct environmental ethic, ethic theory. And I criticize this approach and, and uh, I published a paper um, about it. And um, um, I argue that the concept of intrinsic value has the, Fund, has the metaphysical, epistemological, and ethical foundation in Western philosophy, which doesn't fit with the Chinese philosophical tradition. So, but if we have, um, we use a different approach that like a practice oriented approach, and um, we can find, uh, to, uh, we can find ecological wonder will, ecolo people will have the ecological wonder. So, what is ecological wonder? I think when the people go out of, uh, less, like, like pe if people visit the wilderness often and uh, the wilderness, the special elements in wilderness such like rich biodiversity and uh, like uh, anim wild animals, plants, also the vast space and uh, also the different time in wilderness will have a great potential 
to make people think about the traditional values towards wilderness. And uh, when people start wondering, start wonder, you know, when they encounter wilderness, they can uh, encounter wilderness in person and uh, uh, they can have the ecological wonder. The wonder will triggers a new concept. Okay, so that is I um, I try to use the feelings, the wonder, to construct a environmental ethics theory in Chinese culture. So experience is very important. Experience, and uh, I there's a book. It's called A Sense of Wonder Towards Nature and which is written by a scientist. I, I like this approach a lot because this person has a lot of wilderness experiences and they have construction, a lot of wilderness areas. And uh, the one approach he stressed is just uh, practice, try to cultivate, maybe revive people's feelings of wonder because, because within the culture, within a society, because of agrarian culture, maybe the industrialization, and people already forget about aesthetic dimension of the wilderness. And they tend to treat wilderness as a tool to benefit people's lives. And their aesthetic appreciation of nature in fact has a lot of problem because their aesthetic appreciation of nature, they think only if human beings, you know, revise nature and uh, nature is beautiful. So I think a lot of aesthetic appreciation is problematic. Okay, so that is uh, the, the approach I take. And um, recently I uh, added a special issue a journal, a special issue in the Journal of Environmental Ethics is called Wilderness and Intrinsic Value. It will be published at the end of this year. So I use an interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary approach to wilderness and intrinsic value. And uh, the most important thing in China is now, how can we nurture our appreciations of the intrinsic value of wilderness based on the Chinese culture tradition and also based on direct experience of nature. So that is what I'm trying to do right now. Okay, thank you all for listening. Yeah, thank you, Shan, for this uh, very interesting presentation. We already had some comments uh, from several people in the audience. If anybody wants to uh, question, wants to ask something uh, live, then you can just raise your hand in Zoom and then we can allow you to talk so you can go in direct interaction with Sham. Okay, I find, yeah, I. Should I, the, yeah, I find a lot of comments and um, there's one comment said, do you have already an idea how to communicate the idea of wilderness to the Chinese culture despite being viewed as being Western and not really based in Chinese philosophy? I think it's a very good question. And, um, uh, Yeah, I think we can uh, use uh, interdisciplinary approach to communicate the idea of wilderness. Like uh, um, you know, on every each Sunday at eight thirty, I uh, I organize a lot of on uh, I organize a lot of online lectures. Some uh, I find there's some artists in China. They start working on the topic of wilderness art wilderness art and uh, 
Uh, also, I invited the philosophers, maybe uh, whose research area is Taoism. We do can find that Taoism has a lot of appreciation towards wilderness areas. Also, a lot of the Chinese art in the past get inspiration from wilderness. So I think I have my idea is from different disciplines. We can do find a lot of appreciation towards wilderness area from uh, Chinese art, also Chinese poem. There are a lot of poem which are related to appreciation of the wilderness and also philosophy, uh, also science, which are related to also tourism related to appreciation. So I think we can use a different disciplines use the sources from the trans culture and reinterpret it and uh, rewrite it, reinterpret it and use the literature, art, also science to rewrite the stories of the wilderness. So we can use a lot of narrative. We can also transform the scientific description towards wilderness into narrative so that it will be easy for the public to accept the idea. Okay. Uh, Sean, that was actually a question by me, Max. Um, I okay. love your approach with Wild Out and tomorrow we will present our first two Wild Out events we had. Uh, John mm -hmm. was actually participating in the Wild Out we had in the wilderness area in Italy, but you mm -hmm. also triggered uh, two different uh, things in, in your speech. Uh, we are working on a wilderness cookbook. And no, it is not about how to cook in wilderness. It is a, a collection of uh, culinary delights from the different wilderness areas or the areas surrounding a wilderness. So we have a wilderness in, uh, in, in Lithuania, we have a wilderness in Georgia, and there are special meals around it. And when you told us that the Chinese culture is very culinary oriented, sitting mm -hmm. together over food, maybe you can also think about using that, that, uh, that uh, idea of sitting there over dinner, using the culinary approach to communicate what wilderness is. So we will share with you our wild out and maybe in the not too far future, we will have a wild out event in, in, in China. Let's hope that by that time we all have our vaccine so that we can travel freely again. But okay. uh, thinking about the wilderness cookbook, uh, Jonas is working on that, could be also something. And uh, I really like the approach because we have to make these intrinsic values, these different ideas about wilderness accessible to the people. If they do not understand what we are talking about, uh, and we as scientists sometimes speak the wrong language. We speak a scientific language. We do not mm. speak the language of the common, common is not negative, but let, of the broad public. Let me use that word, which is much more um, ethically correct. It's, it's about the broad public. We live in a scientific world. The rest of the world lives, yes, also on this earth, but with a different language, with different norms and values and beliefs. And if we cannot bridge that gap between the scientific site and the broad public, wilderness will never really get the support it needs. Well, and Shan Gao, I just love your answer to Max's question because of the way you brought in landscape painting, poetry, and even uh, ecotourism. I like that you brought that in at the end is ways in which the public experiences the intrinsic. The other thing I like a lot about your answer is you sort of, instead of talking about how to bring the Western idea of wilderness to China, you talked about how to resurrect the Chinese origins of the wilderness idea. I'm an American historian. And, you know, when you look at Ralph Waldo Emerson, 
you know, yeah. who let yeah. Henry David Thoreau live on his land and who said, when I'm in the woods, I am nothing, I see all. That's yeah. not just an idealism. Emerson was reading Eastern philosophy. And, and in the West, we credit Thoreau and Emerson with, with the origins of the wilderness idea. Maybe in Europe, you want to bring that back to Rousseau. But really, the transcendentalists were reading Eastern philosophy extensively. And so I liked your answer that you brought it back to Chinese knowledge. Yeah. In fact, transcendentalism is also my main research area. I do a lot of research on comparison between transcendentalism and Confucianism and Taoism. So although, you know, transcendentalism, uh, the Emerson draw a lot of inspiration from Confucianism, but however, in fact, uh, he only used some of them which fit with their philosophy, like he liked the idea of human nature is originally good. But however, a lot of like values, he disagreed with Confucianism. So in fact, they, uh, although he draw inspiration, but only from part of them, the Emerson doesn't even understand the system of Confucianism, Taoism very deeply. In fact, Emerson's you know, understanding of nature, I think has a foundation in, in, in God, although he have a different understanding of the God, but it's very different. Uh, nature is um, for, for uh, nature, you know, his concept of nature is similar to maybe P Plato. Um, the creative is creative, but uh, it's creating more forms and uh, you know, influenced by transcendentalism like Emerson, there's a, uh, there's a wilderness appreciation art. Uh, in fact, a wilderness appreciation art, uh, like a Husserl uh, is called, uh, uh, in Chinese, Hardison, Hardison School, you know, which is deeply influenced by Emerson, uh, transcendentalism, but uh, transcendentalism has complete different metaphysical understanding of nature, which is very different from uh, from Taoism, Confucianism. That is, uh, uh, you know, the, the comparison between them is my long-term research, in fact. And uh, I also invite a lot of professors from the world talking about the difference. Yes, yeah, that is, uh, I'm Beautiful. very glad that you can talk about it. Yes, yeah. Thank you for that. And I, I would say, you know, take fusionism back from the American transcendentalists. <laughs> I think that, you know, and, and we have a, we have more to learn from the Chinese idea of wilderness than the other way around. One quick question with intrinsic value that requires an understanding of the land's agency. Like uh, in America, Toledo, Ohio, just recognized the personhood of Lake Erie. So the lake can sue a company for polluting, or we saw in New Zealand, a river being given personhood, that recognition of the agency in the land and even the legal agency of land, which is rooted in scientific understanding, but it's also spiritual and also yeah, political. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like that agency is necessary for intrinsic value. Yeah. How, how in, um, in your philosophical tradition, do you understand agency in the land how do you come to see that agency in a multidisciplinary way because to me that's how you get to intrinsic value yeah i know agency the word agency is very i think it's also very western agency like uh, in a emmanuel Kant talk a lot you know talk a lot about agency is related to i think the word philosophically is related to reason right human beings reason and the agency of the land, I think, is from the human being's reason, move on to the reason, maybe the, the certain characteristic of the land. So I, I, I do think the agency, the, the concept, will gain popularity in Chinese culture. So um, we value is not agency to have self-willed land we should respect it because we understand a lot of things within a relationship. Agency, the concept of agency is not within the framework of relationship. So we may care nature, we love nature, but it's a relationship. It's not respect the agency for its own sake. It's a, it's a different ethics. It's about care ethics. Also, it's called the duty-based ethics. It's a completely different approach. 
So, um, yeah, but I find in agency, the concept do have a lot of spir uh, dimensional spirituality because in the South America, right, I think uh, some rivers are considered have the agency like human beings and the law tend to protect it. So that I, I do not understand a lot of the the like uh, the philosophy and culture in the uh, uh, Chile, like Chile and um, like South America. But I want to know more the, about agency and why, what kind of culture will trigger this dimension and uh, will promote the conservation of this area. Well, okay. thank you. It's, thank I you must go to bed. It's my bedtime. But I just want to thank you for that answer because the ethics of care and saying, you know, intrinsic values based on relationships is a nice alternative to the kind of Western masculine view of agency. I like the your approach there with ethics of care, almost an, almost an eco-feminist view of like the land's value comes from not its use, but its relationships. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. Mm. That's interesting. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Th thank you. Thank you. Question. Yeah. All right. And thank you, Sean. And thank you, John and Max, for your questions. Uh, I think it has been a very interesting discussion. Um, and if you have some last words, <laughs> I will give you the, the opportunity to say them. Uh, otherwise, in five minutes, we're going to have the next uh, presentation by uh, Mr. Zanskiri. Yeah, Sean, do you want to say anything else? Or are no, you done? No, no, no. <laughs> oh. All right, OK. No. Then yeah. thank you yeah, very if, much for your, for yeah, your presentation. Yeah. Thank you. If they, if, I find that in the chat room, there are a lot of questions. And uh, you're welcome to send questions to my email uh, and um, uh, my email address. And uh, I, will, yeah, I will answer all of them. Thank, thanks for the questions. And I think if you send email, I will answer a lot. OK, thank you.